Welcome to the forum, live streamed worldwide from the Leadership Studio at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. I'm Dean Michelle Williams. The forum is a collaboration between the Harvard Chan School and independent news media. Each program features a panel of experts addressing some of today's most pressing public health issues. The forum is one way the school advances the frontiers of public health and makes scientific insights accessible to policymakers and the public. I hope you find this program engaging and informative. Thank you for joining us. Welcome. My name is Chris Kirkham. I'm an enterprise reporter with Reuters focusing on tobacco issues. Uh, I am also today's moderator. Uh, our panelists, starting from my immediate right, are Howard Koh, professor of the practice of public health leadership at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. We have Robin Koval, CEO and president of the Truth Initiative. Vaughn Rees, director of the Center for Global Tobacco Control at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and Mitch Zeller, Director of the Center for Tobacco Products at the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. This event is being presented jointly with Reuters and is part of the Dr. Lawrence H. and Roberta Cohn Forum Series. We are pleased to welcome the Cohn family and friends today. We're streaming live on the websites of the Forum and Reuters and on Reuters TV. We are also streaming live on Facebook and YouTube. This program will include a brief Q&A and you can email questions to the forum at hsph.harvard.edu. You can also participate in a live chat that's happening on the forum site right now. So 10 years ago, e-cigarettes were just entering the US market and were largely popular among hobbyists and small businesses ordering parts from China. Now it's a multi-billion dollar industry. Uh, Juul Labs Inc. now has a $38 billion valuation and popularity is soaring. Uh, one particular question about this popularity is youth usage. Uh, it's of especially grave concern to policymakers right now following a huge uptick in uh, high school and middle school use, uh, especially over the last year. So policymakers and regulators are wrestling with a vexing question. Who and what are e-cigarettes for? Are they a tool to help smokers quit or at least minimize the harm of traditional cigarettes? Or are they a new avenue towards addiction, particularly with youth and with little yet known about the health consequences over the long term? One recent study from researchers here at the Harvard Chan School found that some e-cigarettes were contam contaminated with toxins linked to asthma and other lung problems. How do e-cigarettes intersect with other tobacco-related technologies, such as the ICOS tobacco device that was just cleared for sale in the US last week? Today, our panelists will take on these questions and more. Mm -hmm. But first, let's look at a clip from Reuters about a major e-cigarette maker, Juul, which decided last fall to pull sweet-flavored products from stores following a regulatory crackdown. Working to reduce a surge of teenage vaping, e-cigarette maker Juul said it will pull popular fruity flavors, such as mango and cucumber, from retail stores. On Tuesday, the company said it will temporarily stop selling flavors except for tobacco, mint and menthol in all retail outlets. That's until technology is put in place to scan buyers IDs and ensure they're over the age of 21. The move by Juul coming amid heightened scrutiny from the FDA. In September, the FDA threatened to ban Juul and four other e-cigarette products unless the companies took steps to prevent underage use. That compliance period has now ended. Juul said Tuesday it is shutting down its social media channels on Facebook and Instagram and is working to remove unauthorized youth-oriented content on their platforms. Despite pulling the plug on retail stores, Juul said its sweet, fruit-flavored pods can still be purchased on their website, which uses an age verification system to screen customers. All right, uh, so Howard, uh, Juul pulled those products in November after a threatened FDA ban due to concerns about underage use. 
And this clip demonstrates some of the market and regulatory forces at play here, particularly when it comes to youth use. Um, can you bring us up to date a bit on what has happened since then and also give us kind of the bigger picture on how e-cigarettes and public health intersect? Um, what parallels are there between e-cigarette and traditional tobacco control efforts? Well, thank you, Chris. And it's uh, very important to take this new and very troubling youth epidemic uh, within the broader context of the global tobacco pandemic that's engulfed the world for the better part of a century and more. So just to remind everybody, tobacco use and dependence remains the largest preventable cause of death and suffering worldwide. Uh, we know that in our country, nearly half a million people die each year from tobacco dependence and related disorders. Uh, globally, it's projected by the WHO that we'll have a billion deaths from tobacco misuse this century, unless we do something dramatically different. And when we talk about the biggest public health challenges of our time, this is it. There's no other condition that causes this level of suffering. Now about 98% of those deaths are due to what's called combustible tobacco products. For example, cigarettes that are burned to release nicotine and other toxins, uh, which can cause uh, so much disease and suffering. Uh, the only good news here is that we have a very robust tobacco control program uh, in this country and worldwide that's trying to address all this. And in the U.S., adult and youth cigarette smoking rates are declining. But as you mentioned, Chris, over the last decade, we now have non-combustible tobacco products that heat and vaporize liquids to release nicotine, but, but much lower levels of toxins. And uh, this has raised the discussion about possibly using e-cigarettes as a form of harm reduction, a very fascinating and very controversial topic right now. Uh, the hope is that the use of e-cigarettes could help adult smokers to switch and theref therefore uh, reduce risk. Uh, but a challenge is the uptake for kids. And what we've seen now with the entrance of Juul into the e-cigarette market is this skyrocketing rate of use among young kids. And in fact, just several months ago, a highly respected Monitoring the Future survey, which has been tracking the substances that kids use and misuse, uh, dozens of them, uh, reported that the rate of rise of e-cigarette use fueled by Juul was the highest ever recorded in the 44 years they've been, they've been tracking these outcomes. So. These are very ironic and troubling d discussions to have, particularly in a day and age where the whole country is talking about substance use and opioids in general. Uh, this is another substance use issue that we need to tackle head on, and that's that's the setting for this forum today. So, Robin uh, Howard, you know, mentioned the youth use question. Um, tell us a little bit about what makes e-cigarettes so appealing to young people. Well, they are kind of the the perfect storm in uh, in many ways. So you've got uh, a piece of technology, which is very appealing to young people. Uh, it's easy to conceal. It comes in flavors, um, and it feels cool. Um, and compounding that is the way Juul in particular, but other products as well, have gone to market. So not necessarily as products targeted to a 40-year-old smoker who needs to quit, but in ways that are very appealing to young people. So we have a slide uh, that shows some examples of Juul's early marketing attempts, which I don't have to explain a lot. This clearly shows young, attractive people um, looking uh, you know, like they're having a lot of fun. I think we even have a couple of images there from a Juul competitor called Candy Pens, which uses hip hop stars and young, very sexy women in their uh, advertising, which you know has made these products very appealing to young people. And even more than the investment that's been made by the individual companies is you know the best marketing in the world is when you can get other people to do it for you. And so there was an explosion, and there still is an explosion on social media of young people basically advertising to one another. So even when Juul says they've taken down their Facebook page and Instagram pages, the um, all of this lives on in the social media sphere that young people share with one another. 
The, the other thing that I think is a huge factor here beyond the techiness and the easy to conceal is the very, very appealing flavors that these come with. Young people often don't know that these products <clears throat> contain nicotine. They don't think there are any risks. They think, well, it's just mango, um, which of course it isn't. In our own studies, we know that two thirds of the young people we spoke to, and this is about a year ago, so maybe it's changed, but at that time, two thirds didn't know that a jewel always contains nicotine. Um, and again, when you take a look, I have another slide at the way these flavors have been presented. These are products that, in fact, FDA um, sent letters and cracked down on because they're so egregious. But it's hard to tell here um, what's the e-cigarette and what's the cookie or apple juice product or one that particularly bothers me. This is a very recent one of um, a codeine cough syrup that's abused um, in, in, in by a lot of people, an e-cigarette flavor that's been made to look just like it. Um, so this is what's going on out there. So the, the opportunity to realize the benefit of e-cigarettes is being compromised, but what's happening actually out in the marketplace with young people. Uh, very interesting. Um, Vaughn, can you tell us a bit about where we are now globally in the fight against harmful tobacco, and how do you see e-cigarettes fitting into this picture? Um, <clears throat> that's, the, that's the fascinating question, and, uh, and Dr. Coe's uh, explained to us that tobacco is the, uh, the foremost uh, preventable cause of, uh, of death and disease globally, and, uh, and, and it is in that context, I think, that we need to think about strategies to regulate uh, e-cigarettes. Um, of, of course, we are concerned about the, you know, the rising tide of uh, e-cigarette use, particularly among young people. Um, too many kids uh, have used a nicotine product in recent years who otherwise might, may never have smoked or, or used any such product. Um, and we're concerned because this is driven largely by a predatory industry who target young people with products that are highly addictive. And, uh, and the potential to cause long-term um, harm through addiction and, and uh, the potential to use uh, more deadly products I is very real. Um, I think though we need to examine the bigger picture and I think we need to uh, think strategically about how we can regulate uh, vaping products uh, in a way that, uh, that reduces the harm associated with adult um, um, smoking uh, while ensuring that we have very rigorous strategies to prevent youth for, or young people from um, initiating use of e-cigarettes. Um, we don't want to see another generation of young people um, addicted to nicotine. And so the question is, how might we approach this? How can we uh, regulate vaping products uh, in a way that, uh, that, uh, that protects youth while providing opportunities to adults uh, to reduce the harm or, uh, associated with uh, combusted tobacco use um, and reduces their exposure to the, uh, the, the harmful constituents in cigarettes. And there's been something of, a, I think, a split or a divide in the, uh, both the tobacco control community and the public health community uh, that I think we need to uh, attempt to try to resolve uh, by, by developing a, uh, something of a more unified vision around, uh, around our strategy here. And I think what we need to do is go back to thinking about what works. And we've seen uh, over the past five decades some very effective evidence-based strategies that have had uh, enormous impact in reducing rates of smoking, not just among adult smokers, but, uh, but certainly also among youth. We've seen some of the fastest decreases in youth smoking uh, that we've seen historically in the past few years. Um, so I think we understand what, uh, what these strategies look like, and FDA, I know, are pursuing these strategies quite vigorously. Um, but we need to regulate across product types in a way that, uh, that is synergistic, um, that, uh, that, that, that applies similar approaches to, uh, to both vaping products and combusted products that, uh, that both protect youth and, uh, and, uh, and encourage adult switching. So for example, um, we can impose rigorous uh, restrictions on access to vaping products among young people. We can look at the way young people are targeted through marketing and communications to ensure that uh, that, uh, that uh, manufacturers don't um, make the product more appealing. We can reduce or eliminate flavors, particularly flavors that are appealing to, to youth or young people. We can introduce product standards, particularly around the addictiveness of products uh, to ensure that, uh, that um, adults um, no longer turn to combusted tobacco products for nicotine, but look for, for safer alternatives. Um, 
I think if we uh, take this approach that is that is evidence based that uh, that seeks to uh, um, both protect youth and uh, and reduce harm among adult smokers, um, it certainly is like threading the needle, and uh, and uh, it, it is something of a public health balancing act. But I think with a with a unified vision among those working in the field, um, it will help to define a regulatory agenda and a research agenda to support that mission. So you talk about a balancing act, and uh, Mitch has the pleasure of uh, navigating that balancing act to the FDA. Um, so Mitch, what should regulators be thinking about as we craft rules around e-cigarettes, but also in a sort of changing landscape where we're getting new data about youth usage? Um, and tell us just a little bit about the status of sort of where we are on the regulations of regulation of this industry today. Well, Vaughn uh, talked about the need for a vision, and we have a vision and we think it's achievable from a regulatory policy perspective. Um, the, the challenge is what's going on with kids' uptake of e-cigarettes, but the, the vision is fairly easy to articulate. 90% um, of all adult smokers started smoking when they were kids. In old industry documents, the tobacco industry had identified young people as the replacement smokers for addicted adult smokers who die or quit. So part of our vision is a world where cigarettes as we know them are no longer capable of creating or sustaining addiction. The cigarette would still be out there and it would still be very dangerous and toxic, but through regulation, it could no longer create or sustain addiction while adults who are still seeking nicotine, because we still have 34 million addicted adult smokers whose brains have been rewired by the nicotine in cigarettes, and for those people who are still seeking nicotine in a properly regulated marketplace, they could get them from alternative and less harmful sources. Today it's e-cigarettes. Tomorrow it might be some different technology. It's all possible, and we think that, that vision is achievable. The challenge is, and this goes to something else that Vaughn said, um, as regulators we're responsible for a population level public health standard. And, and, and by law we have to take into account all of the impacts, good, bad, or otherwise. And the law makes it clear that that includes studying impacts on initiation. Any initiation on any of these products by kids goes on to the negative side of the ledger but also the impact on cessation. And with e-cigarettes, there is at least anecdotal <laughs> reports uh, that e-cigarettes and the presence of flavors in e-cigarettes is helping some addicted adult cigarette smo smokers transition away from cigarettes. So it's very much this, this public health balancing act with, within this larger, larger vision that, that we see and that we see is achievable. That, that the challenge is how much weight do you put on these different considerations? From our survey, the National Youth Tobacco Survey, that's an, that's an annual survey, from 2017 to 2018, there was a 78% increase in current e-cigarette use by kids in high school in one year. And that's starting from a baseline where it was already the most popular category of products with kids. And for middle school kids, the increase was almost 50% in one year. And just as disturbing, the increase in the frequent use of e-cigarettes went up almost 40% in one year. Frequent use being d defined as you didn't just use it during the past 30 days, you used it on 20 or more of the past 30 days. It, it's not just for us as the regulators to, to factor all of this in. This is, this is a discussion that we all need to have. How much weight should we put on the negative impacts? How much weight should we put on the positive impacts? There's imperfect science. We don't have answers to all of the, the key questions yet. Uh, yet we as the regulators are responsible for the policy governing the marketplace, and that's what we are navigating our, our, our way through with, with, with imperfect science. But that, that vision that I articulated, even with what's going on with kids and e-cigarettes, I still believe is achievable. Um, so one other question for you, Mitch. Could, could you tell us a little bit about just sort of the, the, the regulations, where they stand right now on e-cigarettes? Because this was a little bit of a gray area sort of for, for a number of years before, um, before a certain rule was put into place in 2016, correct? Sure, so let's go, let's go back in time. And, and, and in the historically unregulated e-cigarette marketplace, we were calling it the wild, wild west uh, because the products were out there. There was no pre-market review of any products coming to market. Claims were being made. Uh, all manner of marketing was taking place. We first had regulatory authority over e-cigarettes starting in the summer of 2016. Uh, and it, it sounds somewhat counterintuitive that we're regulating e-cigarettes as tobacco products since there's no tobacco in e-cigarettes. But that comes down to the statutory definition of a tobacco product, which is anything that's made or derived from tobacco and intended for human consumption. And at least as of now, the nicotine in e-cigarettes is derived from tobacco. So that's how we got 
statutory and regulatory authority over these products. From the day that that rule began to go into effect in the summer of 2016, we immediately began enforcing the youth access restrictions that were referred to earlier. So we have a program where we do contracts at the state and local level, and we've conducted now over a million of these unannounced inspections at retail. And up until 2016, we would see if retailers were illegally selling cigarettes or smokeless tobacco to kids. And ever since August of 2016, we've expanded that program to include illegal sales of e-cigarettes and cigars. So enforcing the youth access restrictions went into effect immediately. But what about the marketing of the products in the first place? Uh, people don't understand that technically e-cigarettes are on the market without a lawful marketing authorization. We have only enabled these products to remain on the market through an exercise of what FDA calls enforcement discretion. And in light of the explosion in the kids' use of e-cigarettes, we've been reconsidering that exercise of enforcement discretion. So in March, we put out a proposed guidance that looks at e-cigarettes along a continuum of flavors. And what we see from the data is mint and menthol flavored e-cigarettes, they're popular with kids, but they are incredibly popular with adults. So we propose, and we're reviewing the comments that have come in, uh, so we have, uh, we're just beginning the process of a final guidance. We propose to draw a line between mint and menthol and tobacco flavored e-cigarettes on one side and all other flavors on the other side. Grape, bubblegum, cotton candy, there's even a flavor called unicorn puke. Um, <laughs> and if a retailer wants to sell one of those products, they can, but if it's a brick and mortar establishment, it has to be in an age restricted location inside the store. And if it's an online retailer, there have to be heightened age verification restrictions in place. At least that's what we proposed in the draft guidance. And this goes back to the earlier notion of this Public Health Balancing Act. The last thing that we would want to see is someone who used to be a menthol cigarette smoker walk into their gas station and convenience store, uh, and they had successfully transitioned to a mint or menthol e-cigarette, but that the only product that would be available for them to purchase is a menthol cigarette. So it's, a, it's very much this balancing act. And the 2019 National Youth Tobacco Survey <coughs> Uh, is in the field through the end of, of, of this month. And a lot of people are, are trying to predict what the results will be. If the numbers go up and go up again in 2019, then we will have to reconsider uh, policy uh, later this year. But, but, but for now, uh, we've proposed it along this line of um, flavors, recognizing that actually none of these products have a lawful marketing authorization to enable them to lawfully be on the market. Thanks for that overview. So. We're going to shift the conversation and take a deeper look now at these issues. But first, uh, let's watch a series of clips that specifically take on the issue of youth vaping. Uh, we're going to begin with one from the Real Cost Campaign of the FDA, one from the Truth Initiative, and one from the CDC. There's an epidemic spreading. Scientists say it can change your brain. It can release dangerous chemicals like formaldehyde into your bloodstream. It can expose your lungs to acrolein, which can cause irreversible damage. It's not a parasite, not a virus, not an infection. It's vaping. I've been vaping, but it's safer than smoking. You know, one jewel pod contains as much nicotine as 20 cigarettes. 26, 26, 26, 26, 26. 20 cigarettes. Huh. Vaping is like safer than Vaping is safe safer than safer than safer than
All right, so Robin, let's start with you as we sort of delve a little more into detail on this. So um, you already mentioned sort of the powerful marketing forces at play and even, even marketing forces that don't necessarily come from companies that are sort of ground up mm. from just the popularity of the product and so the ability to reach friends and strangers through social media. Um, so what can be done from a messaging perspective to combat this? Like, you know, how, how serious is sort of the, the marketing and the, um, you know, just kind of the popularity? Um, you know, what do we need to do to sort of counterbalance that? Well, you know, I, I compare it to, um, you know, with all the counter marketing that's been done on tobacco um, and that we still do, we do that with the wind at our back, right? Young people have been well educated on the risks of tobacco. They still experiment, but we're working from a base of knowledge. On e-cigarettes, it's very different. I think you see in the truth uh, campaign work and the work from the FDA, we have to educate young people because there's so little knowledge. Um, they think they're just uh, vaping flavors um, and water vapor, which of course is not true. Um, as I said earlier, two thirds of them don't even know that there's nicotine in the product. Um, and so one of the things that we've seen is that giving facts, and that's always been a basis of the truth campaign, is you know kind of where you have to start. So that these products do uh, potentially make you four times more likely to smoke cigarettes, which most young people think is disgusting. I would never smoke, is what they say. That there are brain effects from nicotine. Um, one of the things that we know has always been very compelling and something we're considering is, is there industry manipulation going on here, right? Young people don't like the idea of thinking industry is making decisions for them. And now that Altria owns 35% of Juul, make no mistake about it, Juul is a big tobacco company. Um, so when we say safer doesn't equal safe, we're really trying to put something out there for young people to, to grab onto. And, and the real cost is doing the same thing. The other thing um, that we've seen is that um, young people are really interested in this messaging. So we've had higher engagement with, for instance, the, we call it puppets, uh, the work that you just saw from Truth in the last six months. So engagements on social media and places like that than we've had in some of our more recent tobacco campaigns, which has also been very high. So young people wanna know. Um, and then I think the other thing we shouldn't forget is that we now have, um, 20% of young people using these products, a great number of them are really addicted and they're shocked. They say, this isn't what I signed up for. I thought it was just mango and water vapor. And then they can't study, they can't sleep at night, they don't know what's wrong with them. So one of the things we're also doing is we've got a program called This Is Quitting that is the first vaping cessation program for young people. I never thought we'd need something like that. We introduced it in January. We've got 40,000 young people who have already signed up, which I think is a good measure of starting to understand in that population that, oh, well, maybe this isn't what I thought it was. And, you know, I mean, I think one thing that, this is, this is sort of a question going back to your point about how successful uh, the sort of campaign against combustible cigarettes, just traditional cigarettes has been. But, you know, I, I think that there is sort of always this question, I feel like, with young people where, you know, it's just, you know, adult figures telling them not to do something is, is a recipe for, like, doing it twice as much, right? So, so how do you, what was successful maybe about sort of the historical tobacco efforts? I mean, it, it seemed like a lot of that was about really making cigarette smoking no longer fashionable and no longer cool. Is there a way to, to maybe get at that with, with vaping as well? Well, I mean, ultimately you hope to denorm the behavior. One of the ways that uh, has been very successful for the Truth Campaign is, you know, we'll always say give young people the facts, don't talk down to them, don't finger wag. Um, you know, one of the reasons why the Truth Campaign often uses humor, so the puppets are funny, so it's trying to entertain as we educate. Uh, but also, uh, one of the things that's been very um, important in the Truth Campaign is uh, helping young people to understand that when you're addicted, you're not making decisions for yourself. In fact, the industry is making those decisions for you. And so the Truth Campaign has always tried to 
be as aggressive as we can be on industry manipulation, which is taking place and continues to take place. And I always kind of call it sort of the, the double-edged sword on uh, Altria making a major stake in, in Juul. Um, you know, that allows us to say that, well, now they are a big tobacco company too, and how do you feel about that? I mean, the best, in, the best business model in the world is addiction. Right. Exactly. Well, so Mitch, um, let's let's delve a little bit more into sort of the regulatory tools that that the FDA has. Um, and I guess first, you know, I kind of want to. You touched on the the flavor question, and and that there's really kind of, at least right now, you're you're attempting kind of a balancing act even within the flavors. But as I'm sure you know, there are a lot of calls, you know, particularly from you know concerned parents and uh, educators around the country to just just ban flavors entirely. And and I'm sure. That's something that, um, you know, I know that's something the FDA has has looked at. You know, it, it is an option, and um, an, uh, something that former FDA Commissioner Scott Gottlieb, who is very vocal on this issue, he also talked about the potential for possibly banning these pod-based devices, which are which are the um, you know if. You sort of have seen a jewel. It's essentially this cartridge that you that you put into um, the device, and it's, it's it's different than the earlier versions of e-cigarettes, where you know you had a larger tank, and often you were having to buy liquid to, to refill it. The, the pods are essentially a kind of easier, uh, kind of more commoditized version of this. But but Dr. Gottlieb had some had some issues sort of about that, and you know raised the specter that this could be banned if. Uh, you know, the data on youth usage don't increase. Tell us a little bit about sort of the, the tools, including what you're working on with flavors and, and how you're sort of assessing the data as it comes in um, and sort of what, what other options may, may there be if this youth uptake issue doesn't improve. So I don't want to prejudge any, any, any possible uh, policy options down the road, but sort of at a high level. Remember I said earlier, for e-cigarettes, unlike other newly regulated products such as cigars, which because they've been around so long, can be lawfully on the market, there's no marketing authorization for any e-cigarette on the market. They remain on the market because we are exercising this thing called enforcement discretion. So one tool that we have, and that was the, the basis for this draft guidance that we issued in March, the comment period closed less than a week ago, not going to prejudge where we're going to go on a final guidance because we've, we've only begun the process of reviewing the thousands and thousands of comments that we that we received in response to the draft guidance. But one regulatory tool is to revisit this principle of enforcement discretion and ask ourselves through a population level public health lens, how should the exercise of enforcement discretion be used going forward? We came up with an approach in the guidance based upon certain types of flavors without proposing to ban any flavors, just saying, look, you want to sell unicorn puke, that's okay, but if you're going to sell it in a, in a brick and mortar store, there has to be an age restricted location somewhere inside the store. Depending upon whatever changes in the, in the evidence base, we can revisit our exercise of enforcement discretion. The tool to ban flavors is called the Product Standard Authority. And for e-cigarettes, we see that there are two sides to the flavor debate, that flavors could be playing a positive role in helping addicted cigarette smokers successfully transition. By contrast, we don't see the public health benefit to the presence of characterizing flavors in cigars. And so while we have grandfathered a lot of flavored cigars because they meet the statutory definition for being on the market as a lawfully marketed product, uh, because they were on the market as of a magical cutoff date of February 15, 2007, we could use that product standard authority, and we have proposed to do this, to ban characterizing flavors in cigars. And that is our intent, because we don't see the public health benefits of the presence of characterizing flavors in cigars. The e-cigarette the e debate is obviously more complicated than that. And as I said earlier, we're responsible for a population level public health standard. And so we have to account for the positive and the negative impacts of things like flavors in e-cigarettes. So let's take one step back from this and remind ourselves that tobacco use is the leading cause of completely preventable disease and death in the country. The, the conservative annual death toll, mostly because of cigarettes, is 480,000 premature deaths every year. 
That was from the 2014 50th anniversary Surgeon General's report. So you just do the math from that point through mid-century, and that's more than 17 million deaths in the United States just from tobacco use, primarily from first-hand exposure to cigarette smoke. That 480,000 figure doesn't even include deaths from second-hand exposure. What can be done to, 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 to make a dent in, in, in this remarkable vector for disease and death? And I'll just uh, leave you with where I started with the vision that we have, which is a world where the cigarette as we know it is no longer capable of creating or sustaining addiction. And for those who are still seeking nicotine, being able to get it from alternative and less harmful sources. That's what we're working on. Um, I want to move on to Howard, but really quick, one, one other just newsy topic that I wanted to get you to touch on briefly, Mitch, was uh, so last week the FDA, <coughs> I want to make sure I get this term right, authorized for sale uh, a device called the ICOS. The FDA did not approve this device. But tell us a little bit about this, because ICOS is a, it's a device uh, called a reduced risk product by Philip Morris that um, it's different from an e-cigarette in that an e-cigarette vaporizes a liquid that has nicotine. Now this, this product is essentially uses sort of a plug of tobacco that is then heated and then creates sort of an aerosol nicotine. So it, it, it has a bit of the same effect in that it's largely satisfying this need for nicotine. But t tell us about the FDA's um, thinking in, in allowing this market to be sold. In the sure. US. So l let's start with the concept of how this product got to market in the first place. One of the bedrock consumer protection principles that the public uh, has come to rely on FDA for, whether it's for new drugs or even uh, food additives, is companies don't get to decide whether new products can be brought to market. Companies file applications with FDA on a pre-market basis, and FDA examines the science behind a new drug application or a food additive petition, and it's the scientists at FDA who decide whether this new product should come to market. Same principle applies to certain new tobacco products. And this Philip Mars international product, known as ICOS, had to go through that pre-market evaluation process. They filed their application. They filed an application both to be authorized to sell, and they separately filed applications seeking authorization to make health-related claims to either reduce exposure or to reduce risk. Last week, we authorized marketing authorization. We have not yet made a decision on whether any claims along a health line should be uh, authorized for this product. But under that population level public health standard, in looking at the science, and, and the heated tobacco product is quite different from an e-cigarette. We said earlier there's no tobacco in e-cigarettes, even though we are regulating them as tobacco products. There is tobacco in this heated tobacco product. And, and Chris described it as a plug of something called reconstituted tobacco. And the way it works is it gets heated to a sufficient point short of burning, and that releases or volatilizes nicotine and other flavors and things. And we've analyzed the chemistry and the toxicology of this product and the levels of harmful and potentially harmful constituents, not completely across the board, uh, but for many of them is lower than combustible cigarettes. So uh, primarily on that basis, but very concerned about unintended consequences once a product like this is in the marketplace. In addition to saying, yes, you can start selling this product in the United States, there was a lengthy document on post-marketing requirements, obligations, and restrictions to make sure that there are no unintended consequences, primarily uptake of this product in disturbing numbers by kids. Where this product has been available for sale in other countries around the world where there's no pre-market review, the youth uptake has been low. We're obviously concerned about what's going on with kids and e-cigarettes in the United States, but this is a different kind of product. It has tobacco in it. The initial purchase is an expensive purchase, so we will be doing monitoring and surveillance in the marketplace, and we will revisit the marketing authoriz authorization decision if we, if we have to. And, and very importantly, we have not yet made a decision on whether any kind of health-related claim should be authorized for this product. Thanks for that overview. Um, so, Howard, uh, one of the questions I think I get asked the most about e-cigarettes is, um, how dangerous are they? You know, how like is it seems like it might be better than a cigarette, but do we know? And and I think that that seems to be one of the major questions right now is that we're we're kind of operating in this space where we're deciding, you know, how should these be regulated? What are the limitations on their sale? But we're kind of operating from a lack of long-term data and research on this, right? Sure. And so, once again, it's very 
important to contrast the, what we know and, and the status of research in combustible tobacco products and tobacco control from that point of view, and then contrasting that to uh, what we know or don't know about non-combustible products like e-cigarettes. So in terms of tobacco control with respect to cigarettes and com combustible products, the research is robust. Many people in this room have contributed to that research. Uh, we, we know what works with prevention, education, cessation, uh, counter-advertising, smoke-free uh, policies in, in public places, taxation, and that evidence base, that strong evidence base has led to a, uh, a really scientifically based tobacco control public health effort that is global now. It underpinned the so-called Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, was, which was the first international public health treaty that went into force in 2005. So if you talk about control of combustible tobacco products, the public health community is united around those scientific principles. Then shift over to the non-combustible tobacco products like e-cigarettes, there is little research, it's embryonic, it's imperfect in, in Mitch's term. Uh, th there are hopes for moving the science up so we can talk about informed harm reduction, but uh, because this, the data and research is so embryonic, we, we can't say with scientific precision uh, how best to apply a potential tool like e-cigarettes for harm reduction. And so uh, we, we have issues uh, that that all converge with respect to looking at this broadly, and that is, when you stop and think about it, how did a cigarette industry and tobacco industry gain so much biz business popularity for a product that leads to the death of half of its long-term users? Well, they normalized and glamorized this deadly product, and Robin was referring to that. With respect to conventional cigarettes, because of all the work of so many, uh, we can say that the public health community has helped to denormalize and de-glamorize conventional uh, combustible tobacco products. And now we need more research about e-cigarettes. Uh, th there was a uh, <coughs> widely quoted study that came out of the United Kingdom a couple months ago comparing uh, e-cigarettes to standard nicotine uh, re replacement therapy in a, in a randomized trial and showed uh, increased benefits for those randomized to the e-cigarette arm. So that was uh, very important science that contributed to, the, to this debate. That's in the United Kingdom with uh, a past generation e-cigarette device. And, but very importantly, about 80% of those who are abstinent uh, who are in the e-cigarette uh, arm stayed on e-cigarettes for uh, over a year after, after that study was uh, completed. And in short, the long-term health effects of e-cigarettes are, are simply unknown. So the concern now, especially with the youth rates going up, is that we've gone from normalization, denormalization, and now a concern that we are renormalizing all this all over again. Some would say this is deja vu all over again. So that, that's the concern, and that's the balancing act that we're facing here. And as all my colleagues have said, if we try to do our best to investigate how this could help adult smokers, but Keep this, keep this away from kids, that's where we're trying to get to. And Vaughn, I'd like to turn to you on this question of, um, I guess maybe looking at kind of the, the long view on you know, tobacco use and how do, we, how do we cut down on it, but also how do, we, how do we kind of deal with the fact that this is an extremely addictive product and it's very hard for people to quit. And throughout time there have been other solutions put out there, there have been patches, um, other sort of drugs from the pharmaceutical industry, um, they've kind of not had great success. How do e-cigarettes, in your mind, sort of fit into this really kind of central question of how, to, how if we can't get people to just quit cold, what, what are other options? Well, <clears throat> I think e-cigarettes, uh, you know, are a disruptive technology, but we may be able to use that disruptive technology in a way that, that benefits uh, um, the public, um, the public health, particularly of adult smokers, uh, pr by providing um, a, a, a relatively safe or, or a relatively more safe alternative uh, to smoking. Um, E-cigarettes have the advantage that they deliver nicotine in a pulmonary manner. They deliver nicotine through inhalation to the lung 
young and uh, and make nicotine rapidly available, which is reinforcing to smokers. And it is is exactly that sort of nicotine hit that smokers are looking for uh, as as they, uh, they they seek to satiate nicotine urges or cravings. Patches and gums provide uh, a valuable uh, resource for smokers, but they don't provide that uh, that very powerful nicotine hit. And so therefore, uh, smokers uh, are not always successful in quitting, in fact, often not successful in quitting uh, using those mechanisms. So e-cigarettes, e if properly regulated, if uh, made as safe as possible, and uh, and their access uh, to, to young people is restricted, may, uh, may, may be uh, a, a useful uh, alternative. Um, but I, I think I think that you know the question is how do we think about uh, the, the the questions that that uh, or the points that Howard and, and Robin uh, b both separately raised is questions around dem is around demand for tobacco products and what is it about these products that increases demand particularly um, among young people and it's um it's not just the way in which they are communicated or marketed to young people people to make them socially acceptable and cool, but it is the way these products are designed to promote addiction. And uh, we, need, uh, we need to put in place, uh, the FDA certainly is looking at reducing the potential to reduce nicotine levels in combusted tobacco products below the threshold at which they can be addictive. Um, and I think that's a very sensible strategy. Um, we may also need to think beyond nicotine and other uh, product characteristics that promote appeal among young people and think carefully about how we might regulate those. Flavor, of course, is one piece of that. Uh, but there may be other factors that we might want to look at closely. For example, the way in which some products are presented to consumers to look like, for example, USB flash drives. Um, and, uh, and thinking about how products are formulated and presented to consumers that promote appeal and, uh, and increase demand uh, should all be you know, legitimate targets of regulation. So if we can uh, design products to, uh, to have lower appeal, lower demand among young people while providing a, a, um, a safe, effective form of administering nicotine to adult smokers who are looking to reduce their risk, I think we will be getting closer to, uh, to reducing the burden of uh, death and disease that Dr. Coe has described. Right. So it's just like, how do we, how do, we do that? That seems to be <laughs> the main question, is how do we design something that isn't appealing to youth and only falls into the hands of the current smoke, cigarette smokers who, who, who can't stop smoking? Um, well, I think now we're going to turn to some Q&A, and we've got some uh, questions from online and from the audience. And I want to start with a question from Meredith, which is, why not at least temporarily suspend the sale of these flavors, either until they have completed pre-market review or until the youth use figures begin to crest and subside? That might be a question for uh, anyone would, who would like to take it. I don't know, Howard or Mitch? like. Might be one for Mitch. I don't know. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll, I'll start. And again, not to um, not to prejudge where we might be going with policy, but this comes back to this balancing notion. Um, were were flavors to be banned, what would the potential, I would say, from a public health perspective, unintended consequences of that be? Um, if flavors are playing a beneficial role in helping transition some smokers completely away from cigarettes to e-cigarettes. So we're not talking about continuing to smoke and vaping at the same time, but complete transition away from combustible forms of nicotine delivery to pulmonary delivery of nicotine without the burning of tobacco leaves. And um, I think we need to be cognizant of the trade-offs. And it is an open question about how much weight should be put on the, the, the negative impacts of flavors compared to the potentially positive impacts of flavors. It's a question for society. It's a question for um, policymakers and thought leaders that we'd be very interested in a dialogue on going forward. Anybody else want to quickly jump in on that one? Well, I'll jump in and, and <laughs> say I agree um, because I think you know one of the things that um, has become part of the narrative is that these flavors are very important for smokers who are trying to quit or at least 100% switch. Um, there is not a lot of evidence that is out there supporting that. In the same time, 
we know from talking to young people and from some fairly robust, robust survey, data, survey data that that is why young people are using them. So there's a lot of evidence on the youth uptake side and from our uh, study of it, not that level of compelling evidence on the adult hopefully quitting at least 100% switching side. Sure. I can add that uh, the regulatory approaches are, of course, a matter of great debate. But last year, San Francisco uh, passed a ban on flavored tobacco products. And so following how that is implemented, evaluating that closely could provide some of the evidence that we've been discussing uh, needs to be generated here. Vaughn, did you and, have that? And, you know, the, 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 the argument has been put, and I agree with Robin, that there is limited uh, data I, that I've seen that, that's, uh, that suggests that smokers need um, a, a large number of flavors to support their, their switching to a less risky product. Um, some flavors may be helpful to adult smokers, but, the, you know, the range of hundreds of uh, exotic and candy and fruit flavors that are clearly developed to be to, uh, to appeal to youth and increase demand among youth um, should be looked at very carefully and, uh, and eliminated if possible. Um, all right, so let's go to another one. Um, let's see. If governments could require Juul and all other device makers to build in a feature that would enable use only in proximity to a cell phone mm -hmm. carrying the user's certified age, preferably 21 plus, would that solve this problem? Uh, if so, why not impose this requirement as soon as possible? Very interesting idea. Um, who would like to go first on that one? I'll leave it to the other panelists to opine. <laughs> well, I think the question I would ask is, you know, in the age of where anything can be hacked, um, and we've all seen many, many stories about that, I think that, you know, from a um, sort of an ideal situation, is it would definitely be a step in the right direction. I think the question is, is how well could that really be, you know, policed? I think that issue should be explored, especially since uh, there's a broader discussion with respect to uh, control of tobacco, uh, combustible tobacco products of this uh, Tobacco 21 uh, standard that's uh, going across the country. We now have over a dozen states that uh, raise the age of sale for cigarettes to, to 21 from 18. And many of us are hoping that that will be a nationwide st standard sooner rather than later. So. One of the benefits of this conversation is how does this impact not just the e-cigarette world, but the broader combustible tobacco world. And that tobacco age of sale at 21 is an issue that we should be also following very, very carefully. I, I would just say that, uh, that restricting uh, access at the point of use makes sense. Um, some uh, vaping product manufacturers have uh, said that they, their, their target uh, market is, is adult smokers. So uh, if that's the case, then this would, uh, you know, t some technological mechanism to restrict youth access uh, would make very good sense. This would uh, help them to achieve uh, their desired or stated uh, uh, objective and, uh, and help to uh, uh, place uh, these products only in the hands of, uh, of adults and uh, preferably adult smokers. So it would be a, a, an enormous advantage, but technologically <coughs> how we achieve that and, uh, and uh, uh, legally how we regulate it uh, are questions that, that remain to be answered. I'm sure the companies would have no interest in gathering other information about us <laughs> from those devices. And, um, so let's move on. I think we got, yeah, we got time for a few more. Um, this is a question uh, from Heather. I work in SUD treatment. About 75% of our clients use tobacco. Many see e-cigs and vaping as a much better alternative to tobacco use. Suggested strategies for placing this issue on the radar, cost of use, health hazards, et cetera. And that, that's an interesting question because um, you know, I, I do get the sense that, you know, in the UK, there is a little bit of a different approach on this from the medical community in which, you know, I think there is more kind of outright recommendation of, um, you know, use of e-cigarettes to, you know, as a smoking cessation tool. Um, what, what do you think are the, you know, do, do you think there are some ways that, that this could be, you know, suggested to people who are really struggling by, by health professionals? 
this could be the tool that we're looking for. We've yeah. see, we see vast disparities in, in combusted tobacco use among those kinds of populations. In other words, those who use uh, or who have problems with other substance use, people with mental illness uh, problems, um, people from very poor or low income backgrounds have vastly higher or greater rates of uh, combusted tobacco use and worse harms associated with, uh, with combusted tobacco use than the general population. And we, we haven't seen much change in the rates of use among those marginalised or vulnerable populations for several decades, which suggests that we need to rethink policy about how we can serve to better protect the interests of, of vulnerable populations. And uh, if we think very carefully uh, around regulation of e-cigarettes or vaping products, that might provide uh, an alternative to, uh, to, to vulnerable people who, uh, who have not been able to, uh, to, to quit or to uh, switch successfully to a, to a less harmful product. So it may be a valuable uh, resource. Just a, a couple points from the, from the FDA perspective. Um, regulating e-cigarettes as tobacco products is not the only regulatory uh, pathway available to e-cigarette companies. If they want to get an authorization <coughs> as a cessation aid under a different standard, the safety and efficacy standard, they can file new drug applications with our Center for Drugs. Now, that's a, that's a non-public process, so I'm not going to talk about whether such applications have been submitted or not. But it is a pathway, and the Center for Drugs has put out guidance documents, and the door is open for companies to come in and, and, and have a dialogue with drug reviewers at FDA. In terms of what advice to give any subpopulation, um, about e-cigarettes. Um, the Preventive Services Task Force is, has not been able to conclude that, uh, that e-cigarettes um, are on the list as proven and effective cessation aids. Having said that, we have anecdotal evidence, can't make policy on the basis of anecdotal evidence, we have anecdotal evidence that, um, that smokers who had tried everything beforehand, gum, patch, lozenge, hypnosis, what have you, um, it was only when e-cigarettes with flavors came along that they were able to successfully get off of combustible cigarettes. Somewhere between that anecdotal evidence uh, and uh, there being a robust enough evidence base to show that at a population level uh, this is an effective cessation aid is where we need to go. And it can start with these companies seeking FDA authorization, not as a tobacco product, but as either a drug or a device under the safety and efficacy standard, if they could demonstrate uh, that this works to help smokers quit. And if I can say, if the question is putting it on the radar, I, I think this is a very appropriate place to raise the possibility and start the conversation. Because in the broader world of substance use disorders and, and opioid dependence, which we hear about every day, when we talk about harm reduction, we're focusing mostly on methadone and syringe exchange programs, and no one talks about smoking cessation or tobacco control. So if that's a way to bring this conversation into the broader public health world and the, the aim to protect uh, people who are using substances in general, that, that's, I think that's a useful conversation. Well, I think unfortunately we may have to wrap up. So um, I guess I'm just gonna throw it back to, to each of you if you have any kind of closing points or just uh, you know universal solutions to this entire problem you would like to throw out, <laughs> feel free. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll maybe say just one thing that, um, you know, I think this dialogue on e-cigarettes um, and nicotine is going to continue and it's an important one, but I would hope that it doesn't distract from all the other uh, tools we have and things we need to be doing. I think one of the uh, the things that has happened um, is there's a narrative uh, that I think some people are buying into. A lot of us get distracted <coughs> by that if we can only figure out e-cigarettes, we'll solve this problem. Um, when in fact, uh, we have an industry now that is opposing every tax um, increase that is being put out there. And we know that raising the price of tobacco is probably the most effective thing we have to help smokers quit and prevent initiation. And that's just an example. Um, so uh, I think it's an important conversation, but I hope it doesn't prevent us from focusing on all the other things we have. This is a additive to the toolbox. It's not the tool. <laughs> Fair enough, yeah. I think, I think what I would say in closing is, um, as divisive as the e-cigarette debate has been within the public health and tobacco control sectors, it. It, the, the ongoing attention that, that, that this category is receiving is an opportunity to raise 
to society, to everyone who uh, could possibly be interested in this because we all have a friend or a loved one who's been affected uh, by tobacco. Um, and that is to start asking some really tough questions about nicotine and nicotine policy. Nicotine does not directly cause the cancer, lung disease, and heart disease. 90% of all smokers started smoking when they were kids. Half of them became regular smokers before they turned the age of 18. And it's because of the presence of nicotine delivered in an extraordinarily efficient way from the cigarette to receptors in the brain in less than 10 seconds. With pulmonary delivery of nicotine in the absence of combustion, we now have some tough questions to ask ourselves as a society about nicotine and, uh, and the so-called continuum of risk and uh, unintended consequences and intended consequences. Tough questions like, if somebody needs to stay on one of these alternative nicotine delivery products, for a long period of time or possibly forever, how, how do we feel about that? Especially if it's, if it's a technology like e-cigarettes uh, that because there's pulmonary delivery raises what's called the abuse liability profile of this product, meaning it's more addictive or can be more addictive. But what if that's what it takes for that smoker to avoid the lapse and the relapse to the most harmful form of nicotine delivery, which is the cigarette? Howard said, Cigarettes kill half of all long-term users. Cigarettes are the only consumer product that are designed in a way that will kill half of all long-term users later in life. And that's why tobacco use remains the leading cause of preventable disease and death in the country and the world. So my closing thought is this puts some really tough questions about nicotine policy on the table, not just for people in the field and policymakers, but for everybody. Either of you have closing remarks? Very quickly, <laughs> yeah. I realize we're out of time. Um, I think, you know, we've got to keep our eye on the big picture, and that is, uh, that is combusted tobacco use. With, uh, you know, with the advent of the 21st century and technological innovation, we've seen the introduction of new products that have enormous appeal for young people that offer uh, the promise of, uh, of lower risk. We need, to, uh, we need to capitalize on our capacity to, uh, to innovate and to regulate uh, the, these technological innovations in a way that, uh, that, that protects or supports uh, um, reduction of harm among adult smokers while, uh, while ensuring that we, uh, we make these products less cool, less appealing, uh, less addictive uh, to protect uh, young people from ever beginning. And so I, I would con conclude very simply, we have to keep our kids substance free. We have to reverse this vaping epidemic as soon as possible. Uh, and then we have to help smokers find the best ways to uh, quit or, or protect uh, them as they uh, look at possible ways to reduce harm. And then all those conversations have got to support, as all my colleagues have said, this broader conversation is of how best we um, reduce the level of suffering from tobacco dependence worldwide. All right, well, thank, thank you all. Thank you to panelists for uh, sharing their thoughts, and thank you all for coming, and I think that wraps it up. <laughs>